Welcome everyone to episode number 59 here on the Proven Knowledge Podcast. This is the Creator Series. Today I welcomed an audio engineer based out in LA. His name is Irko. Uh, I connected with Irko via Clubhouse back in February. I believe we were in Rothstein Beats. Um, I think it was a networking room maybe. And Irko reached out to me after I spoke on Instagram and he said that he would love to be on the podcast. Um, and I had recognized Irko um through like social media before I never really checked out his work or anything but I told him you know I'd be down to you know connect and it's been a few months but we finally made it happen today uh Irko has worked with a lot of different artists most recently Joey Badass um Black Thought many many others mostly in the hip-hop realm uh if you look on his website you can see his credits I'm not going to go into every single one because there's I mean I don't even know how many at this point probably damn near a hundred different uh, clients he's worked with that are big big time names and it's you know growing every day but a real cool thing that Irko has been working on for the past um, I think five or six months now is building his dream studio out in LA and he's actually been documenting via YouTube and Instagram the process on you know what him and his team have been doing to kind of uh, build it from the ground up literally from the foundations to the acoustics in the room and everything in between so it's been a really cool thing for me to kind of sit back and watch and i think for all of his fans as well and the people that follow him um and we we talked a little bit about that today we talked about his journey you know coming from italy uh where he didn't really have any connections or anything and he came to the u.s and he's slowly over the past 15 years just been working his way up the ladder you know slowly but surely and i think it you know, there's a real testament there to, you know, you just got to put in the years. Like we've said uh, many a times, it's like, it's not always going to start where you want it to start. But if you continue to work every single day and put the years in and continue to make connections, undoubtedly, you know, you will see results. And I think Irko has done that. And I think his journey is just very inspiring to me. I can't even imagine going from a place, you know, that like he said in the episode, he said basically like, there was no hip hop scene. There was barely even, you know, a scene for the lane he was trying to get in. But he has made it happen over time, and he's figured out, you know, how to plant these different seeds everywhere to continue to gain clients, to continue to get better over time. Um, and I, I, I'm just very inspired by, you know, him and his work and everything. And I look forward to hopefully getting to visit his studio uh, when it's all said and done. And uh, man, I enjoyed this episode uh, a lot. And Irko's a really funny dude, and um, I, I refer to him in the intro as the best dressed uh, audio engineer in music. And if you ever see, you know, him with the bow ties and the glasses and everything, you probably know why. But um, yeah, without further ado, uh, let's get into the episode today. Welcome, everyone, to episode number 59 here on the Proven Knowledge Podcast. This is the Creator Series. Today, we have an incredible audio engineer. One might call this guy the best dressed uh, engineer in music right here. Uh, Irko is here. How are you, man? Thanks for having me, Anthony. Great, great. How you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great as well. And I, like I said, I know it's been since I think like February. We connected, I think, in Rothstein's room over on Clubhouse, the networking room. And you reached out about being on the podcast. And I was like, I've seen this guy on social media for the last like three years. I'm like, why would I not get this guy on the show? <laughs> so, And it's funny because I never really like checked out your profiles or anything until then. And I'm like, this dude has a really cool thing going on here. So I'm glad to get you on the show, man. I'm ready to hear some of your story. So basically, to start every episode out, we kind of have the guests give a little bit of info, you know, how you got into music, kind of what your journey's been like up to this point of your career. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, born and raised in Venice, Italy, growing up in a place that was and kind of is still very distant geographically and mm-hmm. culturally from the American music scene and, you know, everything that goes around here, here especially evolving around hip hop. Uh, it was uh, this thing to where everything that I would see uh, about music and, and things like that were on TV. It was kind of like a movie. It was not real, mm-hmm. you know. It was like so distant. And um, but I was so fascinated by it because m- the main reason was that there was no other genre of music back then that had that impact. That you know the size of the drums. And I'm specifically referring to New York '90s boom bap hip hop. Mm-hmm. So like real, real heavy drums and sample driven kind of things. Nothing like that was around in Europe at the time. And um, I just got fascinated because interestingly, I had my first passion timeline wise was with audio. And that got me 
you know, I guess leaning towards the attention towards hip hop, right? right? Because of that content, that audio content. And um, eventually, you know, started, you know, doing little mixtapes, DJing here and there and doing little things. Um, and eventually that thing that was on my screen on TV for coming from the US, I tried to recreate locally, mm -hmm. which is uh, very weird because, you know, the cultural difference at the time, I didn't even speak English that well. So I didn't know what evolved around hip hop music and mm -hmm. anything like that. And um, but the, the I guess the first lucky strike, well, one of many. Uh, was the fact that nearby where I'm from, there's a very, very large American Air Force base. And so at any given time, there's like a little sample of America right there. Mm. Uh, and, and that's kind of like, you know, 45 minutes, away, it's close, you know? And, um, and that allowed me to start interacting with a lot of people from everywhere uh, from the States mm -hmm. and, and therefore starting to learn the culture and the different geographical locations of, uh, you know, the culture in the, U in the U.S. and of course the music and having... You know, the military, it's kind of like a very um, diverse sample of people of all ages, backgrounds, and, you know, tastes and stuff like that in music, you know. So it was very, very great. It was a great experience for me to be able to uh, be exposed to that and in a safe environment, meaning like, you know, I wasn't doing any like big records that were very consequential to uh, my career or anything, you know. So I was able, quote unquote, to mess up it has so many levels and different things uh, so that I could grow my business. And eventually, you know, when I got uh, to the U.S., that helped me so much, you know. But that's, uh, I guess, the very, very beginning, the very origin of, uh, of young Irko in Italy with the Snoop Dogg and the Dr. Dre poster <laughs> on the wall in the, in the bedroom, <laughs> watching them, uh, you know, jumping around lowriders on mm -hmm. a little screen this big on a square, on a cube-shaped TV back in the early 90s, you yeah. know. <laughs> That's incredible. So, so what year then did you make the jump to move over to the U.S.? Like, did you go straight to L.A. from Italy, or like, how did that go then? It was around 2006 when I went to New York City. So, for any European, New York City kind of equals to the United States. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the same thing. Not really true at all, but that's kind of <laughs> like I guess for geographical proximity, or maybe for the movies or something. Or I mean, I mean, even New York is a very consequential city so it makes sense so to me it was always you know oh i'm going to the states i'm that means i'm going to new york and that's what i did right and also you know i was uh, uh, very heavily influenced in the uh, you know with the with the new york hip-hop scene you know so of course it made sense for me to go there and so that's what i did early 2006 or so um i i went there for the first time and it was like such an incredible experience you know coming from a little town going to a place where these buildings are like sky high quite <laughs> literally and uh and and it's it's non-stop it's always going it, it was it was incredible it was really incredible and that um so no la was definitely not on the map at first uh it was more like uh you know let me go to new york and see what happens and then eventually a client of mine flew me out here for a session and i got here and i was like oh wow <laughs> You know, summer year around, hot chicks everywhere, big studios <laughs> everywhere. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've heard that uh, New York and L.A. are kind of different in a way. Now, I've never been to New York. I have been to L.A., but is that true that New York, the kind of the climate and the creative climate is different than L.A.? Is it very, like, night and day, like they say, or not? Most definitely. The size of Los Angeles you know, it's a lot more spread out, so it's a lot bigger than New York. Mm -hmm. And even the population with the extended L.A., it's, you know, maybe double or so. I, you know, don't quote me on that, but there's a lot more people here, right? And um, the vibe also is different. You know, in New York, it's go, 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 go time at, at all time, mm -hmm. which is also true here. But here we have a little more of that island rhythms kind of vibe sometimes. So it's like, yeah, I, I see you. And then maybe, you know, three months go by when, mm -hmm. you, when you actually see the person again. You know, when instead in New York, you run through the same circles yeah. uh, a lot more. Uh, also, you know, the, the car, this is a car city for sure. When New York is not, it's more like a, you know, walk around train mm -hmm. kind of city or taxi cabs and stuff like that. So it's definitely different. And the cool thing about LA though, that I find is that there is um, uh, a lot more diversity in music. There's a lot of hip hop, obviously, but there's also a lot of rock stuff. There's a lot, you know, the, you can go from uh, engineering something from Disney today to do some hardcore hip-hop the next day, mm. you know, easily. And that's very normal here. 
So I like that better. But that being said, you know, I, I have huge love for New York. You know, last time I, w- I went there, I totally found myself looking up at the buildings like a tourist, you know, mm-hmm. even though I've been there for so many times, for, you know, so many times there for so long. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you gotta love it, man. Either way, it's, it's you know, both places are amazing. Yeah, exactly. So I wanted to get kind of into your process of engineering. I think I saw that you're a Pro Tools guy. I don't, you know, don't quote me on that. I don't know that for sure. But what do you use? Are you strictly in the box when you're mixing? And when a client approaches you with a project, how exactly do you begin the process most of the time? Okay, so uh, definitely Pro Tools. I've been on Pro Tools for my entire career. So to me, music equals Pro Tools. I hmm. When I listen to music, I see Pro Tools. <laughs> it's kind of like a, an extension of my arms and ears, right? <laughs> yeah. So definitely Pro Tools. Um, then the, um, what was the other thing? Oh yeah, how do we uh, start working with new yeah. clients, right? Yeah. Okay. Usually what happens is this. Um, somebody in the team of this artist uh, reaches out to me. Most of the times, I want to say half of the times, it's the producers. The other half of the time is split up between the artists themselves or maybe management, labels, a and It depends, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but usually I talk to the producers. That's usually, uh, you know, I, I say that I'm the producer's best friend and the producer is my best friend too. You know, I, I, I you know, uh, cater to that uh, um, relationship mm-hmm. real heavy so that's usually when what happens however with any song that I'm involved with there's always a number of people involved producer or maybe multiple producers artists or maybe multiple artists and then there's label people management people so there's a bunch of people and so usually it's one person that gets me into the situation and then that kind of creates the snowball effect of uh, you know the next time the other people that were involved in that mix session most likely if they like me and my bow ties they will reach out again <laughs> to to hire me again right <laughs> so that's kind of how it happens um b- besides that the the actual logistics of uh, the exchange it really starts with me listening to the music assessing whether i am the guy for the job uh, i do take on maybe um, uh, one third to maybe a half of the stuff that comes my way for uh, uh, reasons uh, that are related to the artistic vision of the project. So in other words, I want to make sure that I am the guy for the job mm. and music wise, you know, like I vibe with the record. I actually like the project, the artist, the producer, whatever the case may be. But, you know, I'm, I'm about to dedicate 10, 15 hours to one song. So I'm going to listen to these things for like, you know, a million times. Mm. Right. So I want to make sure that I'm actually, uh, involved and uh, you know then my heart is in it and of course my name is on it too so it's it's a lot more than just you know do a couple of clicks and, and go for it right mm. and, and then other than that uh, you know I get the multi-track files from the producer or the artist and that's usually either a Pro Tools session or Logic or any other DAW uh, stemmed out files and that's when we go to town mm. and about your question about the in the box or not yes it's been about maybe 10 years now that I'm uh, almost 100% in mixing on Pro Tools. In the new studio, I will have all the usual suspects for compressors, preamps, CQs, and whatnot, but they will be used for the recording stage of sessions. That being said, they will be patched. So if you know you want to come in and do a session and want to use a real 1176 on this vocal that you were about to mix or whatever, or you want to run the kick drum through the dbx or whatever the case mm-hmm. you can still do that of course with the hardware inserts it doesn't really belong to my workflow but you know to each his own right yeah well that's incredible i always love to hear the process kind of how everyone kind of does their own thing because no matter what i think everybody you know they all find we all find our comfort zone a little bit as far as like our workflow goes and how we've been able to maneuver and for you like you said you've been doing it for like 15 plus years now so it's probably you know you've at least got in the habit of doing certain things a certain way and it's it's definitely helped you out i feel like a lot but um i know that you know your list of credits is enormous i'm not even going to go into all the people that you've you know worked with so far but is there anyone that is still kind of on the bucket list of irko that it's like if they approached you you'd love to do a record for them well that goes for any project that comes out my way that i love Mm -hmm. so Really, I do bucket list projects every day. That's that's the the cool thing about you know being you know 
five, 10, 15, 20 plus years in is that you get to be a lot more picky with yeah. what you take on. I remember in the beginning of my career, Anthony, I was working on stuff that was like, you know when they say polishing a turn? <laughs> exactly that. <laughs> so it was, uh, you know, but, but the great thing about the, 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 that decade, I guess, was that I was able to strengthen my muscles on fixing unfixable stuff mm -hmm. and make it work even if it wasn't workable mm -hmm. and you know doing all kinds of backflips to make it work that when i went and started working with the real ones and where you know the quality of stuff that was sent to me to begin with was substantially better then it was like a, a breeze it was kind of like you know when you train for something say a marathon with weights on your on your legs and then you take them off and you feel like you're flash mm -hmm. kind of like that right same thing <laughs> But bucket list stuff, I guess, I would love to do more of the Korean stuff. I do some mm. K-pop, um, uh, but I would like to do more of that. Uh, and it's funny because uh, oftentimes when I do those kind of projects, uh, I get, you know, uh, hey, there's this record to be done by this artist. And then I look up the artist and there's like hundreds of millions of streams. <laughs> it's like, And I've never even heard of this artist, right? So that I would like to do. I would also like to do a lot more alternative bands. And of course, that's a little bit difficult because of my credits list is almost 100% hip hop stuff, right? So it's a little bit difficult for somebody like, uh, I don't know, say Black, Black Keys or Arctic Monkey or somebody like that, <laughs> uh, or bands like that to uh, hire a guy like me to do their stuff. So, uh, but who knows? Maybe, you know, uh, I don't know. Maybe you can make some calls, Anthony. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I mean, I, I do know my friend Mike Daly actually works with NCT very closely. He was a big uh, K-pop group. I might be able to connect you with him. I don't know if he's still working with him or not, but uh, that would be pretty cool uh, connection right there. Um, That's great. So so I know that, um, you know, you're, you're doing the studio, right? That you've been documenting your journey for the last, I think, like five or six months now about, you know, building the studio basically from the ground up. It's kind of like your dream project and everything. So can you, you kind of just give us, you know, the, the as much detail as you'd like, you know, in this episode as far as how that process has gone and kind of how it all came together to begin with. Like, how did the idea start? Yeah, yeah. So when I was uh, in Italy, I have gone from the first studio, which was my dad's basement, to the second studio, which was a huge standalone building, and it was beautiful it was it was a great experience to work there right mm -hmm. when i came to america of course i just showed up with a bag so i didn't have any tools any anything right so i had to basically start everything from scratch and namely because i was freelancing i was basically using commercial studios whether in new york or texas or here it didn't really matter or maryland it didn't really matter i was using other people's uh, facilities which was great you know and of course uh, i get to be in million dollar facilities every day and have uh, the cream of the crop of tools and everything fantastic mm -hmm. but in the back of my mind i always wanted always knew and it was no secret that i was going to open my own spot at some point you know obviously it takes a long long time for this kind of thing to actually happen mm -hmm. um, especially doing it uh, here in california where price of real estate is uh, very very high mm -hmm. it's uh, it's very difficult to achieve um you know the kind of vision that i wanted uh, which is a little bit different than uh, the studios that I have been using for so long. Um, there's like this abundance of uh, two of these, uh, I guess, different ends of the spectrum as far as recording studios here in Los Angeles, but really anywhere. It's either you have these huge Disneyland style things like East West or Capitol Studio, you know, those beautiful places that are humongous, huge consoles, a lot of live rooms. Live rooms are huge. I mean, so big that you can park, you know, buses in there, you know, that, that kind of thing. Or on the other end of that, you got the single room, little tiny studio, whether if it's in somebody's uh, second bedroom at the apartment or if it's a complex uh, of uh, little studios, whatever. That's kind of like the two things. It's either one or the other, right? Mm -hmm. So the big place, you know, two, three thousand dollars a day to get in there and you got everything top notch because... Michael Jackson recorded here because Frank Sinatra's microphone is in the closet and so forth, mm -hmm. right? Beautiful, hey, amazing. On the other end of that, you wouldn't really want to bring, I don't know, Little Pump through your living room <laughs> to record in the second bedroom next to your kids, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or uh, these other studios, complex, where they have a whole bunch of this different little control rooms next to one, another's, one another. They are usually in these... Um, uh, you know, um, 
uh, areas where they have a lot of, um, I don't know, paint shops or places where they fix cars. Not exactly the most romantic or nice to look at kind of place or environment, right? They rarely have outside places or spaces for people to use, stuff like that. Anyway, so I wanted to do something that was kind of in between all of this. And remembering when I first got here, I needed a place to live and I needed a place to work. And I needed both places to be substantially, um, well, not substantially, but I guess affordable for somebody starting out. And even more so in 2021, uh, the budgets and everything uh, like that from the big uh, artists and big labels have also reduced. So, you know, even those guys usually don't go to the big studios because of cost, right? Mm-hmm. So anyway, um, the um, so that was my vision, basically to fill that need that I had when I first got here. And I was like, okay, so let me do something like a building where I can live and work, still have both entities or uh, areas separated so that you can still live if you want to just live and work if you want to just work, right? Mm-hmm. And I wanted to be open to uh, everybody so that people like yourself can, can come in and do whatever they want, whether you are a songwriter or producer or engineer, um, whatever the case, you know? Mm-hmm. And I wanted to have an outside space. That was very important. In California, you know, summer all year round, come on. Like, we need <laughs> a place where we can go out and look at the blue sky every day, you know? Yeah. So that's kind of like the whole journey. It took a long, long time. Um, took about a year and a half to put together the team, acousticians, uh, architects, uh, engineers, and all of that. took me another year or so to find the location, and it took me another year or two to go through the city to get the permits to build the whole thing, and then another year to build the thing, and now we're looking at, you know, three, four, five, six months maybe to build the interior, which is where we are right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man, I'll tell you, it's been super awesome just following your Instagram and everything and seeing the posts and seeing the YouTube videos about like how it's coming along and everything. And I love how you're taking, you know, kind of your fans and the people that have been following you on the journey with you. You know what I mean? It's like you're sharing the experience with all of us. So we get to kind of enjoy it as well. And I got to you know tip my hat to you, man, because that's a huge thing to kind of undertake, especially when it's, you know, just you and you alone trying to figure this out. You know, you said you have a team and everything, but it's like. It's, it started with you, you know what I mean? So you yeah. kind of took your vision and are bringing it to life in such a big way. So, yeah, like I said, man, when I come out there, I got to I gotta at least check it out. You know, got to see it for real in the real life. But uh, uh, hats off to you for that, man, because that's incredible. Um, Thank you. So I know that, you know, you've your Instagram is pretty deeply rooted. I think it goes back like several years, and your YouTube is amazing as well. How have you used social media – to kind of you know develop your brand and develop your identity in music and how has the changes that social media has you know undergone in the last few years has that affected you at all have you still been able to kind of just you know find the right audiences to kind of see your work and maybe gain clients through that like how has that gone for you recently especially yeah i look at social media as basically a big megaphone that I'm using to let the world know about what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I don't really do any like um, paid promotion campaigns or ads or any of that. In fact, you can kind of see like uh, when, when uh, Instagram kind of closed the throttle on the likes and the interactions, the the visibility went down dramatically, but I was like, I'm not going to pay to like get seen. Like I'm not an artist or anything like that. And those that do dabble in music, most likely they will, come to find out about me you know so Mm. uh, so what i do is basically just show the world what i what i'm doing and especially now with the studio construction because it has been such a big project literally from the ground up showing it didn't take me that much i mean the 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 efforts of filming these videos um i mean it, it is some effort for sure but it's nothing debilitating, you know. I think an episode I can nail down in maybe four or five hours. Mm-hmm. By the way, I don't script anything. You probably can tell from my videos. Oh, I'm, no. I'm just, I, I love that, funny. though. I love that, though, because it's super, like, natural and funny. And, like, yeah. I enjoy it for real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I sit in front of the camera. I just, you know, say my stuff and <laughs> be the goof that I am. And that's really it. <laughs> And, and so yeah, so that's uh, it's interesting for me because it's uh, it's a way to let the world know about what I'm doing and mm-hmm. what I have been doing, and kind of same goes for all the other platforms. Uh, obviously, I'm I feel like I'm more of a video guy, uh, as in you know posting for the for pictures. I, I always find it to be a little awkward, <laughs> but instead on camera, 
I devour the shit just like we are right now. Like yeah. it's, I don't, I, I have zero problems with, with, with talking on camera. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm down for that. Uh, the other cool thing about the social media thing is that, uh, you know, the, the, the reach grows exponentially as you do it. So mm-hmm. like my Instagram, I started a long, long time ago. I think it was maybe six, seven years ago. I don't remember. It was a long time ago. It may have been more than that actually. And, um, and you know what? I, I was able to get started really early on that, and I kind of grow. I've, I've grown like a, a following on there, but I'm not an influencer or anything. You know, like I just like to show my stuff and uh, you know showcase my bow ties. I mm-hmm. guess. You know what? You know what my favorite thing you post is though the uh, the memes with the before and after mix. Those are hilarious, dude. Those are yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. That's like my favorite piece of content besides the videos. Okay. I always see those and I just laugh so hard. Like I think you had yeah, like a yeah. Thomas the Train one one time. I was yeah, like, this yeah, is yeah. hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love those too, man. Yeah. And they kind of reflect. They definitely reflect my personality because you know I, I joke around. I don't know, I'm a jokester, mm-hmm. uh, but I do know my shit. You know, it's not yeah. like I'm like I'm fluff on when it comes to the audio. That's all. By the way, that's the only thing I really know about. Because <laughs> uh, you know. Uh, you probably have noticed in the video of the construction of the building. I'm not fucking nothing. I know nothing about no construction. <laughs> My GCs and family and friends make fun of me for having two <laughs> left hands because I can't put a nail in the wall. <laughs> but um, but yeah, so that's that. Yeah, the memes are definitely uh, here to stay. I have so many, and every time I see something online that could be applicable to that, I'm like, oh yeah, that's coming <laughs> that's to the it. next meme. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, that's great, man. So. I know, like, we still got, we're about halfway through the year at this point. You know, we got about a week left in June. Um, yeah. You know, what what can we expect from you coming up? Either, you know, projects you're working on or maybe more content we can expect. Is there anything that you can reveal that you're kind of looking forward to that we should be on the lookout for in the coming months? Yeah, well, besides the studio being finished, obviously that's yeah. the number one goal right now. Uh, but I'm, car- I'm constantly mixing so many different things. I actually right now have two full albums, two R&B albums. Uh, open they the, all mixes exist now so we're in the tweaking phase uh so once both of these projects are out just like any other project that i'm involved in really even singles i always post them on my social media because i'm trying to push uh, mm-hmm. you know my clients but also show the world what i've been doing so that's the music definitely always is ongoing uh, the other big big thing um that's about to begin as soon as the studio starts to look like a studio it doesn't even have to be finished but it starts to be kind of functional uh, is that my team, my audio team, is uh, officially going to get started. So my buddy Steph, who's my recording engineer, is going to move from Italy to here and uh, be the, I guess, first soldier of uh, Team Irko uh, in Los Angeles. You know, mm-hmm. uh, so that's um, you know where that's when the training will begin. I, I will make sure that I can, uh, uh, you know, pass on any kind of piece of knowledge that I have in my brain as far as recording to him so that my clients can have the same service that I would give, uh, but at a fraction of the cost. And that is a scene in which everybody's happy. Steph is happy because he gets to record. My clients are happy because they get to record in a beautiful studio at a rates that are unbeatable. And then I'm happy too, because I get files that were properly recorded that I'm eventually going to mix. Mm-hmm. So it's, uh, you know, I'm very, very happy about this whole um, arrangement and I'm looking forward to this uh it's so bad you know i can't yeah. wait that and also parties man i want to do parties <laughs> at the building and this is like the perfect spot for party town so i can't wait man you're gonna have to come through to one, yeah. one of those now i got a question if we have parties do we all have to wear bow ties is that you don't have of... to but of course the bow ties always i feel like it might have to be part of like the it's like a formal event like every every year co party is a formal bow tie <laughs> event i'll bring out my dress <laughs> shoes i'll find a bow tie i will dress up all right. Yeah, no problem. And if, <laughs> if, if you don't have any, trust me, I have almost 300. So that, <laughs> I was about to say, you probably got a new one every day, so <laughs> just borrow one. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It's a big archive over here. <laughs> oh, man, that's awesome. So if you could go back 10 years ago, Erico, maybe give yourself a piece of advice or maybe not change anything at all, what do you think you would do? Man, I don't know. Maybe not stress about some things. I would say that to myself. Hmm. Uh, I don't know if I would tell myself where I would end up 10 years later uh, because, first of all, I would not believe it. <laughs> I don't think I would. Mm-hmm. And, and second of all, you know, the, 
uh, that push, that fire kind of comes from the uncertainty and like these huge jumps in the dark that I've taken over my lifetime. And the last one and the biggest one by far has been this building for sure. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's been definitely interesting, but, um, maybe, you know, maybe one thing that I would tell myself, uh, then is, uh, to dedicate a little more time on, uh, to personal enjoyment of things. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is I turned my biggest passion into my career, which kind of removed my hobby, my, uh, you know, passion for other things. Mm to be just that, just passions and hobbies or whatever, you know? So maybe just have a little bit of that still ongoing parallel to the music thing becoming the career. So escalating to the ultimate passion, which is making into a career, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, Just, I guess, maybe an idea. Yeah. So 10 years from now, where do you think you envision yourself in your career and in your life? Ah, man, who knows? (laughs) (laughs) Who knows? Um, I think that there's a, there's always refinement that goes into anything that involves my life, whether if that's work or personal. Uh, so I probably would think that in 10 years, everything will be the same, but everything will be a lot better, a lot mm. more of an oiled system, whatever that is, you know, personal relationships, communication, um, you know, life arrangements, things like that, you know. Uh, in fact, my life 10 years ago and then the 10 years prior to that, it's not that different from today. I mean, I'm still in front of freaking Pro Tools every day. It's just that it's it's a little bit different. You know, 10, 10, 20 years ago, I was always in front of a console. I needed a console at the time. Now there's no more console, right? Mm. Um, 10 years ago, I was freelancing around the States. Now I'm building my own spot. 10 years prior to that, I was in my own spot. So it's, it's not that different, really, you know. I guess um, just improved. Mm. It's always like the same but elevated. You know what I mean? You just elevate to the next level. Yeah, exactly. Do you have any final words of wisdom today for the listeners? Final words of wisdom? Uh, let me see. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. If, it, if we're talking to audio nerds, I would definitely uh, say, you know, pay attention. You know, do the extra listen. You know, play one more time before you send it out to the client. That could be a word you know a couple of words of wisdom to potential engineers to music guys uh, you know just generally speaking producers uh, artists or songwriters whatever i would say uh, you know be aware of who your audience is therefore you can craft a piece of content that they can enjoy to the fullest if your audience is uh, you know um, blonde asians that like you know very fast techno <laughs> you know, make sure you know that. Therefore, you can talk to them. And once you grow that um, communication alley between you, the origin, and your audience, who is the receiver, mm-hmm. then that's what matters. You know, you can only have a hundred fans, but if you have a hundred fans that are loyal to you because of what they stand for, which might be the same thing that you stand for, then you've got an audience. You know, it doesn't really mm-hmm. matter. You don't have to appeal to the whole world; just appeal to your audience, mm-hmm. and that will be. I think that's applicable to all kinds of music, uh, regardless of the genre. Mm, exactly. Well, Irko, that's all I have for you today, man. Like I said, I appreciate you you know, supporting my platform and even being on the show today. Uh, keep being authentic, man. I can tell you're a real genuine dude, and I wish you luck on the studio. And like I said, I will definitely, next time I come to Cali, man, I'm going to stop by for sure. Let's do it, Anthony. Thank you much for having me. Thanks, guys, for listening today. That was episode number 59. We'll be back this time next week. As always, hit the support button on your podcast streaming platform if you'd like to send any funds. We'll see you then. Thanks, guys.